to demonstrate um, how to make a two-rim ball. You're on. All right, am I live? You're live. I'm live. All right. So uh, when I started turning, um, you know, back before we had steel tools, we're doing everything with bronze tools. Um, there were two topics that everybody talked about. One of them was uh, how big the, the base should be on your bowl. And the other one was um, whether a bowl was, or whether the rim of the bowl came in and closed. And, and they talked about open bowls and closed bowls. And that was a subject of much, much, much discussion. So after listening to this month after month, um, I thought to myself, I had a long commute, just driving to work every day. I had a long commute, and I thought, what if I did both at the same time? What if I did a bowl that had both a, a closed rim and an open rim? Um, crazy idea that I had at the time. And I, I made a few bowls like that, and, you know, not totally successful design-wise, in, in my opinion. So I started, you know, thinking about what, what could I do with that idea. And I, I finally wound up with, with something that I was happy with, which is this bowl that has two rims like this. They're both open. The, the, the first rim, in the contrasting color here, it's maybe kind of hard to see. The idea is that the, the shape of the bowl extends up to the first rim, that, that in this case is brown, dark brown. And then in addition to that, I also have a open rim and, and not just open rim, a, a rolled over open rim. So I have one rim that's, that's sort of straight up uh, on the bowl and the other one which is rolled over. And I, I like this, I, I, I do this still, I make bowls like this, you'll, you'll see, I've made a, a bunch of, of blanks here today. Um, and, and this wasn't all just for this demo. I, I really do have you know, blanks in, in various stages of this because I do this all the time. I, I do this, this style of bowl where I have the, the rolled over rim and I have the um, contrasting rim up here. I don't think it works unless the, the color on top is contrasting. I don't think it works in a large format. Uh, you'll notice that every example that I have here today is, is uh, you know, no more than, this is probably the biggest one I brought today, maybe four, four and a half inches across. Um, it works up to maybe six or eight inches across. It doesn't really work bigger than that. Um, but I do a lot of these bowls. Here's, a, here's another one. This is um, curly maple on top with some mahogany underneath. Um, here's another one with some bird's eye maple. Hmm, how do I hold that? Yeah, just trying to figure out how to hold that. And some, some nice uh, exotic wood on the top. Um, oh, you're over here now. Okay, great. Um, so there you can see bird's eye maple. Um, a nice rim on top. There's a couple that are, that are smaller, that these are, you know, maybe two and a half inches across. Uh, I do like, I, I make a fair number of these that are sort of uh, walnut with a, maybe a curly maple rim. Um, here's one that's cherry with, uh, yeah, it might be, might be cherry with cherry on top, uh, but there's enough contrast in the rim. Uh, I've got some, some heartwood on the cherry. Um, So I, I do a lot of these, um, it's a bit of a production item for me. I'm not gonna talk too much today about technique, I'm gonna mostly try to talk about the ideas uh, in, the, in the process. Um, so I start a lot of bowls, I, if I have a, a chunk of wood, um, you can see this is, you know, not great wood, this is some hickory. Um, and I've glued on a little piece of scrap wood here, a little tenon for me to, to hold the grasp in my chuck. Uh, I've got a lot of these little tenons in my shop. I reuse them until they're gone. Um, a piece of wood in my shop has to be smaller than this to be useless. Uh, I, I, have, I have a lot of these little, you know, little tenons uh, hanging around. Um, 
this one, this might be the last time I get any use out of this one, but you can see that some of these uh, are taller. When I, when I first create one of these tenons, you know, it tends to be taller and I, I, you know, I shave off a little bit every time I use it um, and, and get three, four, five bowls out of it. Uh, so this is um, just glued on. I've, I've got my, my piece of hickory here, which I wasn't too particular about when I, when I cut it, but it's basically, you know, big enough to get a circle out of. I've got a, a tenon on the bottom here that it's glued on that, that you can see has been reused at least once before. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk too much about that process, but of course getting from there to here, well, we can all do that, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to show that, but I just, you know, either with a parting tool, uh, I've, I've made my, my square into a round um, with a parting tool or, or just with a, with a bowl gouge on the outside to cut off the corners, whatever, whatever process works for you. Um, what, what kind of glue do you use? Uh, I use type bond two for everything. I, I mostly am, am happy with type bond two. Now I, I do also use um, uh, super glue, CA glue, uh, but not for this. If I'm if I'm do I, I use uh, type bond two for any kind of uh, lamination. So here when I'm making the top, I'm going to use I'm definitely going to use type bond two for that. Um, when I'm, when I'm uh, gluing up the, the parts of the bowl that will be part of the final product. In here where I've just got a waste block, yes, I put that on with Type On 2. And I also, I, I buy Type On 2 by the gallon. And then I, I also use Type On 2, if I've got green wood, if I'm, I'm somehow um, roughing out some green wood and I want to seal the, the, the grain, I'll use um, some of my Type On 2 glue for that as well. I don't buy anything else. Um, I know there's products on the market uh, specifically for that, but I find Type On 2 seals the grain. Um, and if I, buy, if I buy Type On 2 by the gallon, then, then I've always got fresh glue because I'm using some of it up to do my, my uh, sealing of the grain. So here's a, here's a piece. This looks you know, just like this on the back. Uh, it's been, it's been uh, made round. Uh, what I want to do is I want to get a, a flat surface on the front here. And um, let's start with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, do my best by eye just to get a, a flat surface here. I've got a bowl gouge. This is a, I don't know, 3 8 bowl gouge maybe. Um, I can see that uh, this wood, this is, this is probably from the same piece of hickory that I was showing you earlier. It's not, it's not flat on the surface. I can feel that that's not, not even remotely flat. I'm just going to by eye. And this, by the way, is going to be the top of the bowl. This is where I'm going to glue on my contrasting wood. Um, I can see that I'm close to flat, but I can still see some raw surface here that I haven't, uh, that I haven't touched yet. Um, so I'm going to go in and And that's just by eye, flat. And no, it's not a perfect surface. I certainly wouldn't glue to that yet. Um, at home, I have a steel ruler. I noticed Tom had this in his shop. I forgot to bring my, but it's, it's actually, it's pretty good. Um, pretty good flat. But I want to flatten that well enough that I can make a good, a good uh, joint. So what I'm going to do is I'm trying to make one of these. I'm trying to make a tenon in here. Uh, so that I can reverse this um, because I'm going to do the bottom of the bowl first. This is going to become the, the top of the bowl. And what I want is I want a tenon in here, but I want the tenon. I don't know if you can see that. The tenon is, is below the surface that I'm going to sand to. So 
So I'm going to take a parting tool and I'm going to create that tenon in here. And one thing that I do is, is when I make this tenon, I used to have trouble sometimes where I would get this tenon and I would reverse the, the chuck or reverse the, the blank and I would try to grip this in my, in my chuck and it would wobble all over the place. And I, I couldn't figure out why I wasn't getting, you know, good, good reversibility. And what I finally concluded is that the, the bottom here, we're so used to, it, as, as word turners, we're so used to, you know, sort of finishing a surface and, and taking the tool away. Um, and, and that may feel okay to us, you know, by eye for, you know, a handmade product. But here, if I want this to be really good for reversing, I really, really want that bottom channel. That's where the, the chuck jaws are going to um, anchor against. I really, really want that flat. I really want, I don't want that to have any wobble in it. So I dwell on that. When I, when I put in my, my, uh, my bottom channel here that I'm going to, to anchor with, I dwell on that a little bit. I, and and I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that, my chuck at home, also Tom's chuck here, uh, if I just do a single width with my parting tool, that's not enough to get the chuck jaws in there. I usually do two. And by the way, one in the middle, that's where the chuck jaws are gonna, gonna land, really. So that's the one that I spend more time on. And then when I do my second width, I try to make it a little bit deeper. I try to angle out just a little bit. Also, I don't know if it's, it's possible to show this, but, but I've got my parting tool. I've got one end of my parting tool up here on the, um, tool rest, but I put the, I put the handle of the parting tool right down on the, the lathe ways. I put it right down here and I, and I pretty much with my right hand, I'm holding on to that handle, but I'm, I'm, I'm not using my hand to make a flat surface. I'm really, I've got the bottom of the, 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 the end of the handle here. I've got right on the, the, uh, the ways of the lathe and that's rock solid. That's not going to move. So when I'm cutting this, I'm going in by eye, I'm thinking about, you know, about how big are the jaws on my chuck. I come in here. Well, how far in am I gonna go? Uh, I'm probably a good solid quarter inch there. And I'm just going to let it dwell there for a second. I'm not really cutting anything new, but I'm making sure that at the bottom it's going to be, it's really going to be flat. And I've got the, the handle on the lathe bed, on the ways, and I'm not seeing any new, new um, shavings coming out, not seeing any new sawdust. I feel like that's flat now. If I, when I started doing this originally, I would just go in there and when I, when I felt like I reached the, the bottom, I would just pull the, the, um, the parting tool out. And I was winding up with, with you know, bottoms uh, of my, when I gripped that tenon, it wasn't necessarily reversible like I wanted it to be. I want to cut my second width. Now I'm kind of at the same point, but I don't want that to be where the where the uh, the jaws land, the the the, uh, the chuck. I don't want that. So I'm going to actually go a little bit more. I'm angling out a little bit. It's not really evident when you look at that, but what I have is I have a I have a flat section of uh, or I want the jaws to land on in the middle when it grips the tenon, and then on the outer side. Uh, it's a little bit, a little bit deeper, so that the the jaws are not anchored, you know, somewhere in the middle of that channel. They're they're right at the right at the uh, edge of the the tenon. That's where I want it to be. And I usually come in just because I'm going to flatten this. I'm going to flatten this with sandpaper, and I don't want this thing in the middle to be in the way when I'm doing my flattening. I'm not going to be doing. I'm not going to be gluing anything to that. And you know, if, if, if there's anything proud here in the, in the, in the middle on that tenon, that's going to get in the way of my sanding. 
So I just come in there and take off, you know, a sixteenth of an inch or so. Not much. One or one or two passes with the bowl gouge. Now I want this part here. This is where I'm going to be gluing my gluing my second layer, my contrasting wood. Oh yeah, there was another topic of conversation I didn't mention. That you still hear, you still hear people talk about this. Oh, I don't use any 80 grit paper. I start with, I, I start my sanding at 220. Everybody's, but, but I will admit, I will, I will confess that I have some 80 grit paper in my shop. This is what I use it for. I get a, a flat piece of wood. There we go. By using the 80 grit, it goes pretty fast. I've got a nice surface here. This is a nice 80 grit, you know, surface. Um, I don't know. I don't go any. I don't go any finer than that if I'm about to glue. For a glue joint, I'm totally happy with 80 grit. So here's here's the use. If you got some 80 grit paper, don't throw it away. Don't don't give it to, to Goodwill. You know, you can use that. That's that's totally fine. I'm I'm totally willing to admit that I use some 80 grit glue in my shop. Okay, now, what I'm going to glue on there is I'm going to go to my stack of little rings. My shop, I've got a stack of these things because I make these all the time. Uh, often, if I'm doing some any kind of open bowl, the the ring comes from underneath the open, the open uh, rim. And I'm going to cut one off from this eventually. We'll, we'll get to that. But I'm going to go in my shop. I'm going to find my stack of rings. You know, here's a bunch of rings that I brought in from, from my shop at home. Got a bunch of these rings. I'm going to find one that's about the right size. And by the right size, I mean smaller than the rim of the bowl for what I'm doing here. With good contrast on it. Actually, none of these are small enough. But at home, I've got more... I've got more of these. So I go to my big stack of these rings and I find the one I want. How do you make those? I'm going to, I'm going to show that. Okay. I'm going to show that because, because there is some uh, technique to that. But what I'm going to do at home is I'm going to find a ring that fits on there. This is too big, but you know, for, for now we're going to, we're going to show that. I'm going to find the one that I want that does fit. I'm going to put some glue on this surface that I made nice and flat. I'm going to put the ring on top of that. And then, well, I'm going to take some other bowl blank and put it on top of the, the whole thing, make a big sandwich that I can clamp together. Or maybe if I'm making enough of these things, I'm going to have two of these. I'm going to have two of these things, both with a ring glued onto them. I'm going to sandwich them up together with two rings in the middle, and I'm going to clamp that together. And that gets me one of these. So you can see I'm in the same point here. It's just that I've got now my new ring glued on top, and this is contrasting. This is going to become the second, what I call it, think of as the second rim. And down here, this area here is all going to be waste the top of the bowl is here. So underneath the top of the bowl, I've got this rolled over rim. I'm going to have this area here that's just waste. Well, that's going to be a new ring. I can take a ring out of there. Where do all those rings come from? It's the waste that I took away, took away when I was making the, the prior bowl or some bowl last week or last month or something like that. I'm going to use this tenon now, this tenon that I made when I was creating the flat area where I could create, where I could glue on my new ring. Now I'm going to take a ring off of this. Let me put this back in. Okay, I've got my bowl reversed. Now I'm looking at the bottom of the bowl, what will become the bottom of the bowl. 
I still got my tenon here that I used when I was flattening this one, the top of this one, and I'm going to take a ring out of here. Now what you don't want is to wind up with one of these. All right, here's one that didn't work. And it's very easy to make one of these. It's very, very easy to make a split useless ring. How do we make sure we get a good one? Well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna true up the outside surface here. Let's think about this. If I take this ring off of here, I want this ring to have a, a flat surface, just like the top of the bowl that I did. I want this, I'm gonna let this side of the ring, just currently on the outside of the bowl, I'm gonna let that be the surface that I wanna to glue to my, my next product. So I need one side of my ring, every ring that I've got here from my stack in my shop is one really crude rough side, and one very nice sanded side that, you know, that has a good surface on it that I can glue to something else and get a good joint. So I'm gonna make that first. I'm gonna, before I cut the ring off, I'm gonna make another flat here that's sanded to 80 grit that will let me make a good glue joint. Now again, hmm, I got this big bump in the middle. How am I gonna get a flat here? I'm not gonna try to make the whole bottom flat. I'm just gonna try to make my ring flat. And my process for that is to cut a bit of a channel here in the middle. If you can see that or not, but I'm cutting a channel that's, that's you know deep enough. And I make my flat area out here. And that's by eye so far. So I've got my ring surface that I'm going to use as my flat surface once I get that sanded. And I've still got a channel in here that's deeper than my, deeper than my flat. And that gives me enough slack in here that I can come in with my sandpaper. Um, maybe we want to go to the other, the other camera here. Okay, so if I come in here like this and I'm sanding, I can get a flat surface. I need to be careful that I'm not, I'm not pushing it this way, I need to be careful to, to keep the, the, the surface, my, my 80 grit paper, keep it flat on there. But I'm trying not to push it into this center area, which is, which is proud of the surface I want. Which is a lot of hot air. Really, all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna come in here and try to make it flat. That feels pretty good to me. Let's check it. I'm going to take my ruler and I'm going to say, you, it's hard to see that, but the ruler says I've got a flat surface here. I'm going to cut my ring out of that. And the ring will have one flat side that's flat and good and glueable. Okay, I had the bad ring, the bad ring that we don't want to make, the broken ring. I need to cut in from this side and I need to cut in from this side. The recipe for making a bad ring is to cut this way first. Don't cut the top first. If you cut from the side first, if you cut into the, the side grain and the end grain first and then come in here and cut the top surface, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna get a good ring. If you cut from the top first and then the side, almost always you get a broken ring. Not good. 
I've got a, you know, one of these thin parting tools. It's what I like to use. Now, while I'm doing this, I'm, I'm picturing how much the, the rim is going to roll over. And I could go pretty thick here. I could, I could actually, you know, come out here and, and cut maybe half inch thick ring. I mostly don't use half inch thick rings. And really, you're only going to get one ring out of this. So I come in, I don't know, three eighths inch. Now, how far, how do you know how far in you went? Well, I don't know if you can see that on my parting tool, but there's a, there's a pretty clear indication on my parting tool there how far in I went. I can see sort of the accumulated sawdust on the outside. I know where I'm at. I can come right in here and I can say, there. I don't know if you can see that. But that, that's how deep my, how deep my cut is. And I'm happy with that as the, the width of my ring that I'm gonna keep and put in my pile for future projects. So I've marked it off. I know how far I, in I can go. You wanna avoid cutting in too far and having to come back and do this one again, because if you do that, you're gonna make one of those split rings. I hate it when that happens. I really want a complete ring. So I'm gonna come over here. There it is. We got a complete ring, no breaks. That can go on my stack. That can go in my supply of rings that I can use for some future bowl sometime when I have, you know, and that's good contrast. And again, this side, this side is the bad side. That's the side that I just, you know, cut raw with the, um, with the parting tool. I'm not gonna glue to that side. That side's gonna, gonna not be my glue joint. But this side, this side was sanded. That's great. I can use that. I can, I can get a good glue joint on that side. It's flat. It's sanded. It's ready to go. Okay, I've got a, I've got a bowl here that has a tenon on it still that I can, when I, I'm going to, I'm going to reverse it again. I'm going to reuse this tenon again. And I need to make some kind of outside shape here. I need to make the outside shape of my bowl. By the way, it looks kind of tempting that maybe I could get another ring off of here. I'm not going to do that. That's, that's, that's constraining my, my shape too much. Now, when I'm kind of cutting this outside, or I, I tend to think of it as the bottom, the bottom profile, I don't know if we can get this camera here, Tom. Yeah, but the idea is that when I'm cutting this outside profile now, like this, I'm trying to think about, as I'm cutting that shape, I'm gonna undercut a little bit in here, and I'm watching the rim which is gonna be my straight rim. I'm, I'm thinking about, I want... Get better focus. There. Okay. So the whole time I'm thinking about where that rim is. I'm thinking about this outside shape. It's gotta, it's gotta match up with this rim. This rim is only, you know, for most of my most of my little rings that I've glued on here, yeah, three eighths of an inch, quarter of an inch. It's not very wide typically. I need to be pretty careful about where I'm where I'm placing the the shape here. So I'm thinking about that the whole time, and maybe you can see that as I'm going to cut. Also, because I'm trying to undercut inside here. I'm moving typically to a smaller bowl gouge. This is, I think, a quarter inch bowl gouge. It says, I think, six millimeter, quarter inch. Um, and I'm going to be undercutting inside here, and there's, there's not a whole lot of extra space. So I'm thinking about using a smaller bowl gouge. I'm just going to come in here.
By the way, I'm also expecting that I'm going to roll this rim. This, this top rim is going to come down a little bit. So I don't go all the way to the top. Go to maybe about there. Bring that over a little bit. There we go. So I've still got some, some portion of the outside that hasn't been final cut. I've got some surface here that's going to be the outside of my rim. But I still want to excavate in here a little farther in so that I wind up with this undercut droopy rim that I like. And you can see I'm kind of excavating this by, you know, left, right, left, right, back and forth until I get something that looks to me like it matches up with the ring. And you can see there that the ring and the outer profile kind of match up. That's what I'm looking for. I'm going to come in and just try to get the best surface that I can without, um, without starting to sand yet. And of course, at this point, you know, I've already reversed this once. I don't know if I really trust this, this tenon to be in exactly the, the same place. Before I reverse this, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to touch up this tenon just a little bit. Just take a little shaving off there to try to get a good tenon that I believe to be really centered right now. And I'll also come in here, eventually we're going we're gonna to want to be able to recenter on uh, a, a live center on this tenon uh, when I do the final uh, removal of the tenon. So I try to give myself a little target on there. I try to give myself a little, little dent in there that I can place my live center into. That's it. That's the outside bowl shape. Now this, yeah, this is really soft maple. I'm not getting a good surface here. I, I would definitely come in here and sand this at this point. Um, yeah, not the best wood to be demoing with. This is very soft maple. Um, but if, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch blanks here. Uh, I'm going to cheat and switch blanks to another one that I prepared earlier. But uh, if, I was, if I was taking my time on this, I would, I would probably go back one more time with a bull gouge and try to get a better surface on that. But, but if I had a surface that I liked, I would sand at this point. This is my opportunity to sand the outside. Uh, I sand the outside eh, probably down to about 180 or so. And in my shop, my convention uh, right now is I'm sanding the outside down to about 180 before I do the reverse. And then final sanding will be uh, reversed. When I also sand the inside. So if that was sanded, it would look like, like this one. Oops. All right, so here's one that, you know, I've, I've gotten to the same place. Uh, this is cherry. This has been sanded. Uh, I've got bit of a rim here that's going to be a final surface. The whole outside of the bowl is the final surface. I've got a nice tenon that I've touched up and put a little, little uh, key on for, for later. Um, this, is the, this is the outside shape of the bowl. That's, that's it. I've, I've sanded down to, I think, probably 180 on this, like I said. Uh, and now what remains is to do the outside here, the, the top side, the top side. Again, this is the bad surface of the ring. The good surface of the ring is glued to the good surface of the top of the bowl. I've still got my tenon on the inside that I'm now done with. I used that when I was doing the, the bottom of the bowl. 
I'm going to remove this tenon as part of hollowing out the bowl. And I'm going to try to get a nice looking ring, a uh, final ring out of this ugly looking ring right now, which is not, not finished. So let's see if we can get this centered back in the chuck. A lot of work. How's that look? Pretty good, pretty good. Just gonna tighten that up. Okay, now I can see, if I can move the camera to show this, but it's all right, it's all right. So you can see that the bottom finished side of the bowl is running pretty true. It's not totally exact, but it's pretty good. It's, it's good enough. And the front, there's a lot more slop on the front, but that's because I glued this ring on the top of the bowl by eye. This was, and then I, and then I clamped it, right? And if it shifted a little bit in the clamp, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of slop in this right here, but there's not a lot of slop on this side, my finished surface. So now what I need to do, my job is to find the round, perfectly concentric, aligned ring that's somewhere inside this rough ring out here. I'm going to do that. Uh, and I'm in a couple of steps. What I'm looking for, oh, it didn't help at all, did it? All right, I'm gonna move this. Can I move that a little bit? Yes, I can, good, okay. So what I want is I want to have a little bit of a roll, a roll over, rolled over rim here, and I'm gonna make this white maple piece uh, into my final ring. And I'm gonna use a spindle gouge for this. And I'm switching to a spindle gouge because, um, just because my aesthetic on this bowl is to have, um, have this ring have a bit of a, uh, come, have the, the ring sort of come back in again. Uh, so that there's a separation between my rolled over rim and my, my straight rim. I'm gonna come in here. And my very pointy spindle gouge can get in there where a bowl gouge couldn't. And I'm just following in here. What I don't want is I don't want this rolled over rim to have any white on it. And so if I see that I don't have a, you know, if the joint isn't totally lined up well, uh, I try to, you know, hide that in here. And I want my wide rolled over rim to be all solid cherry. And then this rim up top here to be all solid maple. And I can see that the, the profile of the bowl, that the profile of the inner doesn't quite line up with this outside as well as I would like. So I'm gonna take a little more off. So it looks like it's in about the right place for me. Something more like that, in fact. Just a little more. Okay, that's my final shape for this outer rim. For this inner rim, this inner rim here, I need to now complete that by doing the inside of the bowl. So now I'm gonna switch to a more conventional sort of outside bowl, bowl gouge technique on the inside here. This rim's getting Oops, did we lose it? Yeah, okay. So with the other with the other camera here, you can see that you know there's not a whole lot of meat on this rim. I I sometimes cut it kind of tight, uh, but the, the top surface here is not finished. The outer surface is finished. It should be sanded, of course. I I would sand it. Um, 
not now. I'm going to sand sand the whole top at once. But but now I'm going to come in and try to to get a nice surface, nice finished rim out of that. I'm switching back to a bowl gouge. I want to take off all of that nasty burn stuff from when I separated the ring off of some prior bowl. And I can see that Tom's lathe is not quite shaped like mine. So this feels a little funny to me. Let's see if we can do it. course, you know, sort of checking for mid-course corrections. Uh, I haven't quite eliminated the glue line here. I haven't quite cut away enough to eliminate the glue line. I feel a little bit, a little bit anxious about this one because it's going to be tight, but we're going to go for it. Might be it. That might be uh, a little deeper, would still be good. I'm going to take a couple more passes on this. A little more depth. And that feels pretty good to me. There's Mostly the profile I want. Okay. Now at this point, again, I'm not going to bar. I'm not going to bore you all watching me sand. But I would sand this. I'm, I'm going to sand to my final. Um, final surface. So I'm going to start on the out or start on the top here with wherever I start and where I what grid I start with depends a lot on the, the species of wood. This this cherry is cutting nice and cleanly. I'd probably start you know 150 ish on the top here. I know the outside is done to 180 already. So when I get to when I get to 180 on the top, I'm going to go ahead and, and touch up the back again, which will reverse sand it at 180. The, the top doesn't get the benefit of re reverse sanding, but the bottom does. And then I go to 220 or you know 320 or whatever. Again, depending on the, the species of wood, whatever is my final grit, I'm going to do the whole thing, top and bottom, do everything. Which gets me. Which gets me to this point. Here I have a bowl that's that's at the same the same point. This has been final sanded, looks good. I've got some 
Um, looks like maple on the bottom, nice cherry rim. I've got the profile I'm looking for. The idea ideally is that this rim looks like it belongs with the shape of the bowl up to that point. You can sort of picture a bowl that ends with that rim. And then I've got this extra rim. I've got this rolled over rim as my second rim. The only thing that I'm missing here is a, a good bottom. This, is, this still has that ugly looking scrap wood down here. Oh, by the way, if this tenon were longer, I would have parted this off. I would have, I would have, um, but, but, but the tenon on the bowl that I just showed you doing the top of uh, is not long enough to do that. But I, I probably would have parted, this looks like I may have parted this off. And so perhaps, um, the tenon that, that used to be here that maybe was longer, maybe I parted this off from that and I can reuse that, that scrap wood for another tenon for another bowl uh, next time I'm creating, you know, the really raw blanks here. But what I've got left here is a tenon that, you know, it's probably big enough you could, you could get that, you could get that gripped in, in your, your jaws again, but I'm done with it. I, you know, what's left here, it's, I don't know, fat 16th of an inch, maybe it, it, it might be an eighth. It, it, it's probably less than an eighth of an inch. Um, I'm ready to just part that off. Now, how do you do that? I know a lot of people um, have trouble with that. And, and there's all kinds of solutions out there. What do I do with the chuck key? Here it is. There's all kinds of solutions out there. Some people at this point go to a vacuum chuck. You know, you want to you want to reverse turn that vacuum chuck. You know, vacuum chuck makes sense. The, the only thing is, these are small bowls, right? A vacuum chuck. The strength of a vacuum chuck depends on area. And this is a small bowl. You could you could probably hold this with a vacuum chuck, but you know, it, it's it's not the ideal candidate for a vacuum chuck because it's so small. Well, back in the day. Vacuum chucking was a bit of a new idea. I, I taught myself to do this sort of thing just with a just by jam chucking it. So I'm going to show that. I've got some other bowl, some other thing. This is the one that, that I, I showed you earlier that I, I sanded this off. I know this surface is flat. Uh, it hasn't moved. Oh, it still looks flat to me. Uh, looks good. So let's jam chuck this thing and I'll show you removal of the final leftover tenon here. Because I know a lot of people get anxious about that. And I've got a process that, that I like that I've used for a lot of years and served me well. I, I do not have a vacuum chuck, chuck set up. Uh, at one time I was tempted to do that. And then I realized I do that all the time. I don't, I don't need a vacuum chuck. I don't need another special purpose tool for that. I can just do, do what I've always done. Why not? So this is where I'm going to bring up the tailstock. And this, this is the bowl. I'm going to try to move that tenon on. I'm going to bring it up like this, bring my tailstock in. Now, if I'm lucky, I've got a little spot marked out here. Oops. So just a little bit. Okay. That's better. If I'm lucky, I've left myself a little, a little spot there, and I know where it is, uh, where I'm going to put the, the middle of my cone. But this one doesn't have that. This one just has, you, know, you can see that I parted it off kind of rudely uh, from, from some, some other uh, piece of scrap that, I'm gonna, that I wanted to reuse. So I'm going to put the cone, I'm going to put the cone in the middle of that circle as best I can. But I'm not going to tighten it too tight. I'm just going to bring it up here and I'm going to see to myself. Uh, let's go. Let's go with this top camera again. Let's switch back to that. Great. Okay. So I'm going to come out here, and I'm just going to turn this by hand, and I'm going to say, "Does that seem centered?" And I see a little bit of wobble in that. 
And, and my process for, for centering that better is to turn it until I see the biggest gap between the, 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 um, the rim and my thumb. Maybe this camera angle isn't totally showing you that. But there's a gap. There, and there it's touching my thumb. Now there's a gap. Now I need to know, I know I need to move this bowl closer to my thumb by half that distance. So I loosen up my tailstock and I recenter. And yeah, it's still not quite there. So I, again, I found the biggest gap. And I'm going to move it closer to me by half of what I think that gap is. And again, this is all by eye. But if you do that two or three times, within two or three times, I can get that really, really close to center. Now again, we're all used to the idea that, you know, we're going to use the chuck, we're going to use, we're going to use centering. I just centered that by eye and I came really close. My first attempt by eye to, to get this live center centered on my tenon was not great. I was off by, you know, an eighth of an inch or so. But now I'm, I'm pretty close. I'm very happy with that centering. By the way, it doesn't need to be perfect anyway, but you can, you can do very well with sort of progressively successive approximation. Okay, I'm going to remove that. I've got enough tension on the tailstock to hold that in place. I know that the top is flat because this, this, uh, this blank has been made flat. And I just, I'm going to cut that off. And I'm going to use, I, at this point, you could probably use a bowl gouge. I, again, like to bring my spindle gouge in here because I can get in really tight. I've got a long point. I can get in really small. So this is my way of removing any kind of a waste block at the end. Move this out a little bit. There, maybe you can see I'm down to, I don't know, quarter of an inch. I'm using the pointy, pointy nose of my spindle gouge to get in there pretty tight. Okay. Now at this point, if I was at home, I would be, I would sand that. And I guess I am going to demonstrate that because this is my one and only chance to sand that. And I would normally have some 220 paper. This is probably not 220, but fine. I'm just going to sand that flat. If I did a decent job, it doesn't take very long. Okay, now you ask, what about this little nub right here? How big is that little nub? See that? It's not very big. I got that down to, I don't know, less than an eighth. Sometimes it'll just pop off with a little pressure. That's not happening. Do you have a, um, do you have a skew? 
second drawer down. Second drawer down. Yes, okay. So I'm going to borrow one of Tom's skews here. And I'm just going to pry it off with the skew. Oh, but it's still not right. Look, there's still a little, little nub there. What happened to my sandpaper? Well, oh, I do have my sandpaper here. That's okay. So I've got, I've been doing this long enough that I've probably developed a little callus on the end of my thumb, and I can do this. Uh, I recommend that eventually you, you develop that callus. Just my way of solving that little nub at the end here. And I just cycle around. And I do that until it's gone. And this turns out to be hard maple and it's taken me longer than I would like, but I can see what I'm doing. I'm pressing hard with my thumb. I'm pulling some sandpaper through. But really, the nub is pretty well gone. And how much you want to, how much time you want to spend on that is kind of how much of a perfectionist you want to be. But that's a flat. But oh, you have to switch to the other. But that's okay. So you can see that that I've got a flat bottom on that. The other camera. There we go. That's it, a nice clean bottom, clean bowl, all done. All right, obviously we have defective equipment here because I didn't hear any questions. Well, Tom has muted everybody. Are there questions on this? Happy to take any. I have one question. Yes, who's that, Ron? Ron, yeah. Okay, so when you glued the ring on, did you pay attention to the grain? Yeah, I, I usually do. Um, and sometimes the, the grain um, is a factor when I'm choosing what ring out of my stack of rings in my shop uh, to use. Um, so yeah, I, I try to make, the, I try to be mindful of the grain. So you align the grain. Um, yeah, but, but again, it, it's very clear that these are two pieces of wood. They don't match. Uh, the, I, I can't align the grain perfectly. I can make the grain be in roughly the same direction. That's why, man. Yep. But again, I think if you did, if you, if you, for some aesthetic, you know, made the aesthetic choice that you wanted the grains to be at right angles to each other. Um, although, you know, you might worry that, that those, uh, two pieces of wood won't, won't, uh, that the, that the, um, the glue joint might ultimately fail because you did right angles. You did perpendicular joint instead of a parallel joint. Um, these rim, these rings at the end, the, 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 uh, the amount of wood in this ring is very small and it, it's, it, so it, it's very flexible. So I, I think you could do that. Oh, another thing I finally, I, I, I should mention, I had this pressed up against here like this with a little bit of pressure. Sometimes you wind up with a, a rim that's burnished a little bit from, from that final operation of removing the, the, uh, the tenon on the bottom. I usually take some, I don't know, 400 grit sandpaper, and just kind of lightly remove any kind of burnishing that happened on the top here. Uh, before I put finish on, sometimes sometimes that'll that'll show through the, the, the finish if you don't do that. So I I've I've learned to just I you know usually have a, a couple of pieces of really maybe 400 500 grit paper and just sort of do a quick 
just to take the burnish off. I can see a little bit of burnishing on the top of this cherry. Cherry, cherry shows it a lot. So I usually do that. So what's your finish of choice? Um, so it depends on the species, but a lot of times, uh, sort of my, my go-to finish, my main finish that I use most of the time is I, I buy the um, seal cell product, which is a, a wiping varnish, wiping, wiping lacquer, wiping varnish kind of thing. Uh, general finishes, you can get that at Woodcraft. Um, I do, depending on the, the species, I'll do two, three, four coats of that. Uh, rubbed out in between each one with some some steel wool, um, and then usually finish with some kind of a, a, a top coat that's that's mostly wax. Uh, I, I mix up um, I mix up some wax. Again, the, the formula varies from time to time, but I usually have some beeswax in there. I put in a little bit of, of carnauba wax for a, you know a harder wax finish. Put some kind of oil in there, which could be tongue oil, which could be walnut oil, which could be you know any kind of uh, sort of finish oil, oil finish. Um, I'll mix that up in a glass jar and I'll put that in the microwave, not on full power. I put it on like you know, I, I'm 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 a little worried about my microwave, but I'll I'll put it on like you know, third power or a quarter power, and slowly heat it up until the the wax melts, and then stir it. Take it out of the microwave, stir it, and, and let it harden on the counter. And I wind up with a soft wax that I can uh, apply as a top finish. By the way, I, I do not, I do not uh, aim for a hard shine. I know a lot of people really like the glossy finish. I, I look for a softer finish. That's what I like best. I really don't do a, a hard gloss finish. That's not my aesthetic. Have you tried diatomaceous earth and mineral oil as a rubbing compound? Um, I, I know what you're talking about. I've seen that. Uh, no, I haven't tried it. I've, I've you know, my, my finish process, um, is something that I settled on probably 20 years ago and, and haven't looked back. Nice job. Thank you. Very nice. Very nice. Good job. Thank you. Nice Thank job, you. Jim.